Welcome, AXA family, to Common Purpose, Uncommon Times. As always, I'm Wes Smith and extremely proud to work with and serve each of you. Thanks for joining us again. For the last three weeks, we've had uh, some great conversations uh, about racial injustice and what we can do in the education system um, to eradicate uh, the structural racism that has historically plagued our system and denied our students uh, the opportunities that they deserve each and every one of them. Um, tonight, we're, we're not going to turn away from that work necessarily. Uh, we have some other topics we want to get to over the next several weeks. Just know that we're going to continue this work. Um, just today, the ACSA board voted unanimously to support ACA 5. We're going to work and be intentional about supporting that so that we can change representation uh, in our colleges and universities. So we look at diversifying the teacher uh, pipeline, the administrator pipeline, it really starts with getting more students of color into our colleges and universities. So we're proud of the board for taking um, that vote today. Uh, we've also had several meetings with our racial injustice, racial intolerance task force. We're looking at some policies and some legislation that we can co-sponsor with CSBA and other allies. So we continue the work. Tonight, we're going to to pivot a little bit because we've got some uh, just amazing allies and friends, some legends really in, in, in the field of education and what we do, um, that decided when they were watching the state, when they were observing leadership, um, coaching leaders, uh, they saw some, some qualities, some skills, and they wanted to write about those necessary qualities and skills uh, in this reality. And so they wrote an article in our EdCal today, uh, in fact, nice how that works out, huh? Uh, so we have Rini Townsend, Jim Brown, Walt Buster, uh, great, great allies uh, for all of us, really, in public education. We'll get to them in, in just a minute and hear um, what they think all of us can do um, to build those leadership skills that are going to allow us not just to survive, but to thrive times like these. I, I, I can't wait to hear what they have to share. But before we get there, big week. Uh, last week. Uh, the budget was passed. And I've got to say, your voice matters. Uh, you spoke up, you spoke out. Uh, we told the governor and the legislature, uh, legislature that we could not reopen schools safely, uh, that we could not provide high quality learning opportunities for students this coming school year um, without a fully funded public education budget. Uh, and the May revise was not that. Again, uh, you spoke up you got their attention and it mattered. Uh, the budget deal is much better than the May revise. Um, we didn't suffer the 10% cut to LCFF. Um, we didn't just send the money to one concentration, but instead to the base. So the benefits concentration and supplemental subgroups. Um, we protected some of those categoricals that provide necessary opportunities like CTE and adult ed uh, we were able to get the equalization money for special education. Uh, so again, students that, that really, really need those resources. Um, you fought for that uh, and you got it. We're going to have some deferrals and, and those deferrals are going to make cash really, really important at the beginning of the year. And so we know you're out there right now doing all those things you can to improve your cash base uh, and be prepared for this. Um, and there's so much more about the budget. You've heard from so many people. Um, Edgar was on last week in our weekly news chat. Uh, you may have heard school services or capital advisors or FICMAT. Um, but we just wanted to once again share from our perspective how much we value your voice and your advocacy and to let you know it worked. Now, we also had some trailer language at the same time that, that confused a lot of you. As, as we've told the legislature, CDE, and the governor, um, we sure would like it when they provide this support that it actually makes sense to folks, because then we spend a lot of time trying to clarify what they mean. Um, and in AB 77 or SB 98, there was confusion over distance learning. Was it permissible? Did you have to have notes for doctors? So on and so forth. But the intent of, of the governor and the legislature is that we reopen to the extent possible physically, and that we do so safely, of course. Uh, but to the extent possible, 
that's where they want us to get um, as often and with as many students as we can, or as they like to say, as is practicable. Um, but they also know that we're gonna have to do some distance learning. And in that distance learning, they want to make sure that it's high quality, as do we. We called that out in our reopening guide. They're demanding the same. We heard about that last week from Dr. LaSalle, our expert on the show. Um, and so that's theirs. But there's confusion about your ability. Let me just tell you that we met with the governor's staff, with uh, the Senate staff, with the assembly staff, and they all agree that they were hoping to provide the flexibility that you need to open schools according to your variables and ac according to your local public health guidelines. So yes, you can do distance learning. Yes, you can do hybrid models. Um, do you have to have a doctor's note if parents um, opt out of sending their students to the physical school environment? No, you don't have to provide a certification or a note. Parents we know are gonna hold their kids back because they're going to be um, concerned about the health risks or they have people at home uh, with pre-existing condition. Um, so the flexibility is there. We even pressed them and said, what about opening only in a distance environment to begin with so that we can make sure things are safe? And, and they paused for a second because we, we, we caught them. <laughs> and they said, um, well, again, again, the intent here is to re-engage the economy, get as many people back to work as we can, provide childcare. Uh, but if public health supports your proposition that distance learning is the safest thing for your students, then we want to provide the flex flexibility for you to do that. So there was the answer. Um, and so once again, we've been trying to fight for clarity on your behalf. Uh, the message is it's flexible. Do what you and your stakeholders think is best. Work with your local public health. And if you have to look at one of the public health guidelines, you know, AXA supports the CDPH guidelines. We think that they're most in alignment with what the governor wants uh, and really set you up uh, to do the work that you need to do. Um, so those are our updates uh, for today. Let me um, pivot now and, and bring our guests in. I've, I've, I've been so grateful uh, in my profession to have been benefited by amazing leaders or teachers who have, have come before me. Um, I've had so many mentors that I would do an injustice to name a few. Um, but the people with us today are, are in that group. Uh, these are folks that have mentored, supported, and placed amazing amounts of, of, of folks in this state. Um, so let me introduce them. And what I'll do is, um, just, just for the sake of, of our production team back there, I'll introduce one at a time, and then I'm going to ask them to respond to this. Um, first off, give us a bit of your history, your background, and then why why did you write this article? What motivated you to write this article? Uh, and in the article, you all, all three of you, called out leadership, um, not just public education leadership, but all leadership. Why? What was that all about? Well, let's start with Rini Townsend. Rini, welcome to uh, Common Purpose. Uh, why Thank don't you, you introduce yourself, share a bit of your history, and answer that question, please, and then we'll we'll go on. Okay. Thank you, Wes, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, and thanks to all of you for the great work you do every single day. Uh, my history, very, very briefly, was teacher, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, superintendent, and I got a chance to start a school's program all throughout Central America and was a partner in Leadership Associates. And my entire educational career has been focused on leadership actually from whatever position i held and in staying focused and so um, i would say that the number one thing that we kept talking about as we talked through this article was how impressed we are with leaders throughout the state who are demonstrating their staying focused on what matters the most and that is powerful teaching that leads to great student learning and the kinds of people that we called out in the organ in the paper really exemplify a diversity of people and purposes throughout our history and I'll just mention three very very quickly Frederick Douglass an amazing man who was a slave who educated himself was a great orator a great writer and he pushed relentlessly for abolition 
He influenced Lincoln greatly, who is another one we call out, and everybody knows Lincoln. And But what's important is, is as uh, one author of his work um, called out about his team of rivals, that we surround ourselves with the best people and the people with the most diverse opinions, and we listen to them. And then we take it all in and act. And the other person I just wanted to call out was Frances Perkins. She's somebody not a lot of people know about. Our social security is thanks to her. She didn't never want to be in the limelight. She was selected by FDR as the very first woman cabinet member. And she served throughout his administration in so many ways that I encourage any of you to look into what she did. But one was a speaker orator, one was pulling our country back together again, and another one did her work behind the scenes and was incredibly powerful and meaningful. So all of them, all three of these people, plus the others that are in the article, are examples of great leadership who stay focused on what the mission is. And so with all the competing demands, staying focused on teaching and learning is the way to do it, and we do it through relationships and communication. So... In a nutshell. That's, <laughs> that's <it>. great. <laughs> Thank you, Brady. Thank you. Uh, Jim Brown, how about you? Hi, Wes. Nice to be with you today. And uh, thanks again to all our colleagues in California and across the country who are doing great work on behalf of children and calling attention to the right things. Uh, I uh, always considered myself as a, a teacher, well, regardless of what I was doing. Uh, like, and so I like to describe myself as a teacher who masqueraded as a principal and superintendent throughout my career. I had the privilege of working with uh, uh, great students and staff in uh, Pasadena, in Cambria, Lompoc, Palo Alto, Glendale, and then in the last few years working with leadership associates, helping school districts uh, develop good leaders and find good superintendents and other district leaders. It's, uh, it's curious in a lot of ways how uh, what led to each of us participating in this. Uh, we're drawn together, uh, the three of us, uh, for a long time by uh, a belief in the importance of good leadership making a difference in organizations and particularly in education. And the leaders that we have seen, whether they're uh, in school boards, in superintendents, in classroom teachers, in principals, uh, it's been very, very clear to us that people who do the right things in leadership are the ones that can truly make a difference for the education of children. Uh, we were prompted in part, Wes, by some comments that you made about what you're observing in leadership in the challenges that people are facing today and we thought of many examples uh, throughout the state, people we've worked with or read about that are really making a difference for, for, for children. So I think that was the prompting factor. I will say one other thing without getting too political, but uh, we all of us are very discouraged by the leadership, the lack of leadership we have seen in some cases, particularly in the national political arena. And uh, I think it's people like our superintendents and our teachers and principals that are continuing to show everyone what good leadership is really like. And that's what we wanted to write about. Yeah, thanks, Jim. That's great. Um, we also have Walt Buster with us tonight, as I said. So Walt, same, same question to you. Thanks. I have a very similar background to what Rini and Jim described, but I think probably some things that are happening to me currently have impacted me to want to thank our educational leaders. Um, I've been privileged to be on the California Endowment Board for the past nine years, and that's a large healthcare foundation that's committed to equity. And I was the only educator on that board. And when I saw the contribution that could be made through school leadership to help the most needy in the state, it sort of made me think, how can we think people together like this? I'm also uh, privileged to be a board member for Ketchum University in Southern California, which trains everyone up to medical doctor. And they're, the students are mostly people of color. And they're people who are just working so hard, coming from diverse parts of the world to learn to be doctors and physicians assistants and 
all those occupations, and they're just wonderful people. And I thought, in, in getting to know them, what did the public schools do to, to give you a chance as a person of color to be in these prestigious positions? But probably the thing that was my biggest reason for wanting to write this article with my two friends, and Jim's right, we've been working together for years, and we probably talk to each other every day about something or complain about something or talk about old people's physical problems or something together. But um, I think the thing that impressed me most is my daughter is an assistant superintendent. And when I look at the struggles they're having with layoffs and budget cuts and figuring out who goes to school and the fact that she's been able to work with collective bargaining units and tell me every day about Boy, you know, this is tough stuff, but I love my work and we're going to do the best we can for kids. I'm just proud of her leadership. And I see that she's making a real effort to make things better for kids. And I wanted to thank her and all of her colleagues for the good work they're doing. That's great. Thank you, Walton. Rini wanted to add on a little bit. Um, so go ahead, Rini. Very quickly, um, I want to also call out the whole classified staff, um, the people that are doing all the daily jobs in the school, the assistants to the superintendents, the aides to the teachers, the bus drivers, the, the custodians. These people have an enormous impact on teaching and learning and the success of those things and have a great deal to offer, a great deal to say and to, get, and to help put the focus on kids. So I, I just encourage us as we think about focus of the organization that we include all of those people as well as leaders and as teachers. Uh, Rini, thank you for that. On this program, we mentioned all the time that we are absolutely at our best when we collaborate, when we share leadership, um, when we work together, um, then we're, we're up for the task. Um, Rini, the, the, the next question is for you. Um, th these are, as we say, uncommon times, historically uncommon. What do you see as the most significant challenge facing today's education leaders? Well, oh boy, it's a complex one. Um, part of it is technology, but part of it is the demand on everybody's time to be something to everybody. Um, the competing interests that people have. And I think it goes back to the point I made earlier, which is really, it's the leader's job to stay focused and listen carefully, listen more than speak, but listen carefully and then draw people back to their part in making the priority of student learning the number one thing that we do and not letting anybody get you off track. Thank you, thank you. That's. Uh Again, great, great advice. Um, Jim, you, you've talked about uh, leadership that's not defined by a time, but you also mentioned um, some examples of contemporary leadership skills that may not have always been critical, but they're certainly critical right now. Why don't you speak to some of the things you're seeing people do in these times that are essential so our members can emulate and build these qualities? I think Jim, Jim has paused, I think. Walt, why don't I move that one to you then? Walt, take that one. What, what, what do you see as one of those contemporary skills? Things you know, that we have, to have now that maybe they didn't always have to have. I've had the uh, opportunity recently to um, attend virtual school board meetings where you have people on Zoom sitting around in a room. And I am just amazed at the skills that I see a superintendent being able to manage that technology. And, and Jim and Rini and I have talked about the, um, the days when people actually had to come to our office and make an appointment if they wanted to talk to us. Now one email can become viral and go spinning around. So as we were writing this article, we thought about the, the skills that leaders have to have today and technology that makes their job so much more immediate than it was for us. Uh, there is the, the, the amount of time that we see people putting in, and we mentioned in the article, we also noticed that 
in some places, there's just a lack of appreciation for leadership. Uh, we mentioned it here that we talked to one one urban superintendent who was trying to tell me that he he had thousands and thousands of computers that went out getting those computers to the poorest kids in the Central Valley, and then having those kids not have internet connectivity, and then putting internet connectivity in buses. And the whole time he was saying, telling me this, he was saying, one more time, it's the kids who are the most needy that are being the most challenged. So as I, I listened to him, I thought, boy, what a, what a, what a leadership skill that, um, that this contemporary group of leaders in schools, whether it's technology people or classified employees or superintendents or board members, just the immediacy of having to deal with all the technology. And then on top of that, a pandemic where we can't even figure out exactly when school is gonna start. Those are all things that I didn't have to face. And just so appreciative and so much in awe of the professionalism that I've seen. And, and Jim mentioned this, and we talked about this in the article, the demeanor that we're seeing in leaders today, not losing their, their patience, sp spending time talking to people, being encouraging, saying this too shall pass, we're gonna make this work. But I think what we've, the reason Rini mentioned those leaders from the past, we see those same skills of professionalism, calm demeanor, and they really are transformational leaders. And I, I should have mentioned too that I've been fortunate to work with doctoral students for the past couple of years through the Brandman doctoral program. Many of them are educators. The skills they're bringing, that they're so bright, they're the cutting edge. What the three of us have said is we're in good hands with this group. We wrote the article because they wanted to thank them for what we see as admirable leadership work. No, Walt, I appreciate that. And, and I'll tell you, that's exactly what I noticed and why I wrote the article that I wrote. Um, you know, when I saw Chris Hoffman and Elk Grove being forced to make a decision, the first decision in the state, uh, before there was any guidance from the governor's office, even though we had said we need yeah. some guidance, Chris made that unpopular decision. Uh, and you, you recall that you and I are with Chris at Northern California yes. superintendent yeah. meeting That's right. the, day, the day he was facing that challenge. And we followed up on with Chris, what he did and your article was the impetus for our article. And I think what we all agree is this, this great sincerity that we have an appreciation for the, the leadership that we're seeing throughout the school system. Oh, thanks, Walt. Now we we're, we're trying to get Jim back in. I think he's back in. Let's, let's see if his uh, audio is working. Jim, give it a try. And respond okay. to both like. How's that? Looks we good. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, I, what I wanted to add to that, and it, it, it seems to me, it's it's in the what leadership skills today require is the ability to deal with a much greater degree of complexity in our life, in our society, in our world than we had to. It wasn't that it was simple. There were a lot of complex things. You know, I can remember, you know, going through the 9-11 and going through 1968 and all the, all the periods of challenge that we had. But today, the complexity of issues and the seriousness of those issues is something that our leaders really have to pay attention to and I think do very well at. For example, when there are different lenses now, whenever we're dealing with issues, the lenses we have to look through are lenses of equity lenses of race and gender. Uh, lender, uh, the equity lens is always something we have to ask ourselves. Social emotional intelligence issues are critical. And the act of teaching itself has gotten more complicated and has to be more sensitive to the needs of different children and their backgrounds. And leadership is right in there with them. So I've noticed that to stay up in leadership today uh, this is, sounds crazy, but we have to read more than we ever did in a variety of fields. We have to have a series of different lenses we look at. We have to include more people in collaborative efforts to, to address the serious issues we face. And we have to stay persistent at what we do. We can't, it's so tempting to throw in the towel sometimes and get frustrated, but the work we do is serious, it's important. 
And I really admire the persistence of our leaders, keeping focused, as Rini said earlier, on teaching and learning all that we have to do to make excellence in teaching and learning possible for everyone. Oh, Jim, thank, thank you for that. I'm glad we got you back. And you never have to worry about the AXA family throwing in the towel. Our, our 18,000 strong, they're leaning into this. And as you know, because you wrote about it, they're inspiring others to lean in, step up and lead. Um, Rini, you wanted to make a comment about this contemporary skill set. So yeah. go ahead. Just briefly, um, we all three, Jim, Walt, and I have all touched on the technology. But the thing that's different, and Walt mentioned it too, but is the speed of, the, of everything moving. I mean, everybody wants instantaneous. And the main thing when I think people are really doing a great job and we're watching them do that is still emphasize powerful, skilled speaking and writing because what we don't want to do is have our own unforced errors that we shoot something off and then we've caused something to go viral which takes us sideways so those basic skills that people have uh, have learned over time we can't overlook those because that's the heart and soul of what we do in communication no thanks thanks Rini. let me um remind our our acts of family watching the feed if you have questions um, we'll try to get to some of them, and if staff can help us out, they will. But put those questions in the comment section. Um, I, you know, Jim, you just mentioned the equity lens, and, and, and this is a topic, as I started the show, it's on all of our minds. Racial injustice and intolerance, the structural racism that plagues the system and therefore plagues our students, um, that's on folks' mind. So let, let, let's talk about that. As you've all of you, and, and I think this is what's amazing. I, I hope the people that are watching tonight realize that the folks we have as our guests um, have placed, mentored, developed thousands, thousands of successful leaders around the state. Um, and so as you've seen successful leaders, superintendents and others around the state, uh, what are they doing related to equity and racism? What are those skills? What are those actions that you're recognizing around the field? And, and I'm going to have each of you answer that one. So, Rini, I'm going to start with you because I think this is probably the most important topic today. So I want to hear from each of you. Go ahead, Rini. Being bold and not shrinking from the pushback that you're going to get. Um, I also had an opportunity to chair the Urban Education Dialogue for quite a number of years. It was superintendents of the big urban school districts. And we came together three different weekends during the year without an agenda and without minutes and a to-do list or whatever. And we talked about the big issues and these issues came up repeatedly and they talked about what they were doing. They encouraged each other. They met with each other separately so that they could have a plan of action that kept expanding in this area to provide equity across all of their students. And they represented huge range of students. But what had ended up being is they are bold leaders and they don't shrink back when somebody pushes at them. They stay true to what they are trying to do. And that's what people in every position in AXA must do and that we see them doing. And so that's why we're proud of people that we see out there is they're pushing hard. That's a great point. Bold leadership. Jim, same question to you. What, what are um, effective equity leaders doing in the field? One thing they're doing is they're calling out the issues related to equity that we have to deal with. Uh, I would say, you know, over the, over the years that I've served in public education and earlier in my life in private, equity didn't get addressed and talked about as much. Things were assumed. It wasn't really in my life until the effect of schools movements came along and the importance of educating all children and that we can do it and there are good practices out there that we can learn from. So one thing that I, I see certainly is a, a willingness to address the issues more openly, a willingness to bring people to the table uh, that might not have been at the table before. Anytime we look around a room now, who's in the room and who's not in the room that, that should be in the room. And er we have multiple opportunities, particularly in superintendent roles, uh, to, to, to speak with staff and, and community. And how often do we call out these issues of equity or social emotional intelligence? Because the two are, are, are related in many, many ways. 
And uh, I, I've seen more and more examples of that. And in my own life, I, I look back and, you know, on the regret side, I don't think I'd, I, I know that I didn't do enough of that early on. Uh, the greatest gift that I've had in my life, beside my family, everything, is public education. Because I grew up in going to private schools and uh, teaching in a private school at the beginning, which I really enjoy. But public education has opened my eyes to the differences among us, the commonalities, and it has really enriched my life in a lot of ways. And uh, the, the more that I can, the more that I can learn about how we can do better to serve all children is important. And I think I'm seeing that in a lot of our colleagues as well, that constant learning, I've got to grow, I've got to learn, I've got to do better at this work if we're gonna serve children well. Thank you. Walt, same question to you. It wasn't that long ago that when we went to superintendents conferences, Renee Townsend was the only woman superintendent in the room. Um, and looking back on that, I, you know, I just, I, I wish that I, I agree with Jim. I wish I had been more strident, more angry, more demanding. And I'm so appreciative that I see so many women and people of color stepping into leadership roles. And, and I'm, I am proud of their um, changing of the narrative and, and taking this assertive stances that we know lead to controversy, but they sort of have a, I've had enough of that stuff in the background. I'm, I'm gonna take the chance, I'm gonna be a truth teller and I'm doing it because I look around it and I see who's in my classrooms. And it's just not fair that certain kids get more than others. And what I see superintendents and principals struggling with right now is the pandemic has exacerbated that gap. So I am just uh, so pleased to see that we have a changing face of leadership in California, that we have people that look like our kids that are in schools. And we also have people who have strong voices and who aren't looking at the political consequences of speaking out. And for that, I am very thankful to be a, a part of that growth. Walt, thanks for saying that. And I know that you are three advocates when you're engaged in the work and exactly uh, promoting that. And, and while we've, we've seen some growth, um, we're a long ways from where we need to be. We certainly need more uh, superintendents and leaders of color. We need more women in the superintendency and women of color. Uh, we need folks who are uh, openly members of the LGBTQ plus community to feel safe uh, in those roles and for school boards to prioritize hiring all of them. Um, and, and to do that, we gotta have more folks in the pipeline of color uh, and of that diversity. And that brings us back to why we supported ACA5. Uh, and I know you're, you're, you're true to your word and you do this work. Um, we're getting better, but we've got a long way to go. We've got some great folks out there that, that deserve and need to lead right now. Um, last last question. This is rapid fire. Uh, Deborah, shout out to Deborah. Uh, Deborah had a question. Um, what book? Uh, what book would you have or recommend if you could only pick one? And I'm only letting you pick one. Uh, panelists, what book would you recommend folks read? Um, Jim, I'm going to mix this up. We're going to start with you. Uh, the Underground Railroad, and which addresses the issues of slavery and why it is still with us and why it is so urgent. We deal with that terrible heritage and the legacy it left on, the stain that it left on our country. Thank you, Jim. Um, Rini, how about you? Well, mine is kind of along that line. It's the biography that David Blight did and won a Pulitzer Prize for on Frederick Douglass. Um, it's a remarkable review of history and a remarkable view of a man who just spent his life fighting this horror and made a real mark and just an unbelievable man. Um, I, it's a big giant book, but it is worth going through every single page uh, carefully. So I, I recommend that book highly. Thanks, Rini. Walt, we'll finish with you. I just read a book that was the, um... NPR book of the month last month. It's called The Street. 
written in 1945 by the first African-American woman to sell a million copies of the book. It's a wonderful book describing life in Harlem and in Brooklyn in the 40s. The tragic thing is when you read it, things are exactly today like they were in the 40s for women of color. But it's a, I would really recommend it. It's called The Street. Hey, panelists, I just got to thank you so much for taking time uh, to spend with the AXA family on Common Purpose. Um, I, I said in the beginning, I've looked up to all three of you in my entire career, and to have you on is such just a great honor. I'm, I'm humbled by your participation. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Tanya Hill Gillick. She posted in the comments that she is a new member to AXA. Welcome to the family. Just know that if you want to be on a team that prioritizes the rights and needs of students, that steps up and speaks out on their behalf, you pick the right team. Welcome. Um, and to all of you out there, um, even isolated, you're, you're not alone. We're with you. Um, together, as I've said, we're not going to just come out of this or get through it. We're going to prevail. We're going to be better when we get through this. Uh, and we are going to change the system together. Mark my word. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next Monday night on Common Purpose, Uncommon Times. Be well. Be safe. Thanks.